What if I told you there's a simple way you could add seven and a half years to your life? A procedure that doesn't cost a thing and doesn't involve doing anything difficult or unpleasant. Well, I'm happy to report that this miracle treatment exists and you can start doing it right away, even before you finished watching this video. It's backed by science, it's totally safe, and it's all in your mind. Here's the secret. Are you ready? You need to think positively about aging. Really, that's it. Think good thoughts about getting old. Yale professor Becca Levy has shown that people with a positive attitude towards aging live on average seven and a half years longer than those with a negative attitude. And they often feel younger as well. In our study, in the Irish Longitudinal Study on Aging, where we looked at aging perceptions and coupled those measures with objective brain health and physical measures, we found that many people had a positive attitude. They considered themselves younger than their chronological age. Maybe somebody of 60, 65 would say, but I feel 40. So what's stopping us from feeling good about aging? Ageism. And right here, I want to make a distinction about aging versus ageism. Aging is normal. It's a fact of nature. All of us are aging all the time. Are you aging? Great, that means you're alive. On the other hand, there's nothing natural about ageism. Ageism, when you discriminate against people just because of how old they are, that's a kind of social sickness. We shouldn't try to fight aging. And we can't, anyhow. We can and should fight ageism. When does ageism begin seeping into our psyches? It starts early. From the time we're little kids, we're bombarded by the message that old age is just awful. Old people are depicted as fools, creeps, monsters. Who'd want to end up like that? I mean, yuck. This horror continues as we age, when we do everything we can to try to keep looking young. Except that when we actually get to old age, it's usually a lot nicer than we expected. Studies show that people at either end of the age spectrum tend to be happier than those in the middle. Behold the U-curve of happiness. Another benefit of old age is that we tend to get wiser. One of the things that's beautiful about wisdom is you're able to know what's important and what's not. You're able to see what's valuable, what's central, what gets you where you need to be, and what is peripheral. And younger people have a much harder time. All of us in our world, it's so busy. We've got so many distractions. Everyone's telling us that everything's important at once. If you want to cut through that and get to the real meaning, ask somebody older. In our brain, wisdom builds up in the semantic appraisal network, which you could call the wisdom network. It's connecting an area of the brain that's the anterior temporal lobes that seems to help us access knowledge. There's another part of the network, some areas in what we call the orbitofrontal cortex, which is sort of right behind our eyes and, and up above a little bit. That area is involved in making evaluations, and those are very tightly connected. And then the amygdala is in there too. Uh, amygdala helps us immediately notice when we've made an evaluation that's, that's personally relevant to us. There could be a punishment or a reward here. We want to sit up and take notice and maybe behave differently. Old age and the wisdom it brings doesn't just help guide our behavior. It may even have been responsible for the survival of the human race. Of all the animals in the world, only humans, and a couple kinds of whales, tend to live for many years past their reproductive age. So why all these extra years? One possible answer comes from the grandparent hypothesis. One advantage humans may have had over other animals is that with our extra years of life, we could have three generations living together. So while the parents went out to get some food, the grandparents could babysit their grandchildren. The idea is that these old people can provide subsidies in terms of calories, food, or protection, or more interesting, knowledge, cultural knowledge, that they can pass on via language to their younger kin, meaning their grandchildren and their children and their nieces and so forth. And because these young individuals are related to them, by definition, they have a higher chance of sharing the same genes. For centuries, people have searched for the fountain of youth, when it turns out that all along, we had the fountain of old age. At this point, 
Some of my younger viewers may be thinking, wow, Josh, being old sounds great. How can I become an old person? And my answer is, be patient and take good care of yourself, which means joining the fight against ageism. Because ageism isn't just an attack on others, it's an attack on ourselves. Ageism is the only universal prejudice. If we live long enough, we'll all have a chance to suffer from it. So when we think bad thoughts about older people, we're also being biased against our future selves. So how do we make the transition to an age without ageism? We can start by making sure that everyone has something meaningful to work for, even after they stop working. You know the blue zones, the areas of the world where uh, populations live oldest? One of the things they have in common is purpose. That as people get older, they still have purpose. There are always needs. There's need everywhere in society, and everybody can contribute to helping with those needs. Everybody. So let's learn to age without ageism. We'll be healthier, we'll live longer, we'll love ourselves at every stage of our life, and we'll be better equipped to succeed in an increasingly complex, even contradictory world that requires us all to depend on one another. Let's treat our future selves with kindness and compassion. And then, while we're at it, let's do the same for everyone else.